This is the second part of a podcast with Lee Craigie, going over some of the stories in her new book, Other Ways to Win, which is a little odd given we recorded this over Zoom while Lee was self-isolating back in 2020. Of course, the stories are the same, and in this we'll talk about the Highland Trail, the Silk Road mountain bike race, the Adventure Syndicate, and Cycle Therapy, the scheme she established to help young people who'd been excluded from school. And because Lee had been British mountain bike champion, we started with British cycling. I didn't really fit in, Simon, to be perfectly honest. I was a little bit long in the tooth by the okay, time how, I was how, how should it have been? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, I guess like any discipline, to a certain extent, you need to really kind of compromise and drill down and narrow your focus and make massive sacrifices. And, and I did all of that to a certain extent, but I think because... Uh, because I'd come from a slightly different place. Um, I did all of that, but always with a bit of a critical eye. So I was always sort of second guessing things. And I mean, there wasn't there wasn't a day went past when I wasn't like, what did I just do that training ride for? Four hours, the pouring rain, staring at a heart rate monitor. I used to enjoy this stuff. Or, you know, I'd drive the length of the country to ride around a muddy field instead of going into the beloved hills of the highlands and, and just mucking about for fun. And so... And I think that I think that's healthy. It, it made it harder. It made the process harder. Like if you can just switch your brain off and just be like 100%, this is the training plan, um, then you can probably stay focused better. But I don't know, there's something about that being critical about a process that um, that is, is part of the way I learn. And uh, so I was I was kind of grateful for that really like always questioning I think my coaches hated me for it <laughs> right, right. When, you, when you when you say critical you don't mean you don't mean sort of in the negative sense you mean in the questioning sense that's right yeah you yeah. want you wanting to uh, asking why am I doing it so at a, po- at a point they just say because I say so I guess <laughs> yeah exactly and that's exactly the point actually so I think sport I'm not saying anything against any of the coaches I work with. They were absolutely brilliant. But I think traditionally sport and especially the higher level of of sport, um, you are often asked to to do things without explanation, um, you know, to to just to, to remove that bit of your brain and just just do as you're told. Um, and that's never been the way that, that I function. And it's actually, retrospectively, it's not the way that many people that I associate with now function. And interestingly, when I started to dig into this a little bit more and, you know, started to really quiz the idea of why more women weren't involved in sport at this level, it turns out that um, research has shown that, that women do learn in a different way. They need to be brought alongside. They need to be able to ask questions to to get into the the reasons why and what, how it makes them feel and sort of work through a process with somebody else. And so traditional coaching methods that are just like, you do this, um, then that, that didn't work for me then. And I, I can sort of see how maybe it, it wouldn't work for many people. Um, but instead, a, co- a coaching method that maybe brings somebody alongside and gives them gives them the right to, or the, the autonomy or the skills to create their own learning that that seems to work for me and therefore for a, a lot of the people that I now am associated with. Yeah, I'd like to talk next about the psychotherapy, but why did did your sort of career in elite racing come to an end or did you did you decide you just had enough of it or was it that just you got to a point where you thought, well, that's I've, I've done it now, I want to move on? Mm, yeah, I always knew that I was going to draw a line under it after the Commonwealth Games, um, you know, to, to be selected for that and to have the opportunity to compete on a home stage in my hometown of Glasgow, um, you know, that was just, it was never going to get better than that. And to be honest, I was probably, emotionally, I was probably done the year before that, it it's so hard to stay on top of this stuff year in, year out, to, you know, to stay on top of that really sort of hard top-end fitness just takes so much. I mean, how much this. How much does it take out of you? I mean, what, 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 what were you in the gym all the time? I, I know you'd have to periodise it across the year, but, I mean, are you trading once, twice a day? 
Oh, yeah, so quite often split sessions. It would depend on the time of year, but um, but yeah. The, but the actual, the actual training itself, like the structure of the hard training, that was all right. I could probably have done that indefinitely. It was everything else that goes with that. Mm. And there's no point in training as a full-time job and not making all the other sacrifices. So, like, everything that you eat, the amount of hours that you sleep, the quality of relationships, therefore, that you have with the people that you love, um, the social engagements that you could commit to, um, your turn making the dinner, you know, your turn taking the dog out. It, all, all of these things are, are a compromise and it just puts so much strain on, on everything. Um, and it's very selfish. And, um, and you know, I wasn't earning any money at the time. I was, I was full time. I, I got my expenses sort of covered by sponsorship and Scottish cycling, but I wasn't earning anything. Um, so this is... This, I had to be time limited and for the love of what it was that I was doing as well I mean um, I love riding bikes I love being physical and active but the joy was starting to leak out of it yeah. because I was being chased the whole time you know I don't know about you but I, I hate that feeling <laughs> I'm much much better at chasing than, than being chased and so you know when you're when you're I guess at, at the top in your game or in if you're near the top um, when I was British champion at the time, just for the Commonwealth Games, everybody wants to beat you, yeah, and um, and it's a horrible, it's a horrible feeling. I hate, it really made me question what life was all about. <laughs> Yeah, I can I can imagine when I've often thought that when your if when your sport becomes your job, uh, for me it would be a pastime. Um, it mm. would never be. It would, I'd never make a living through sport. I've never been <laughs> anywhere near, near, near good enough. <laughs> <laughs> but but you kind of think then, well, what am I gonna? You know, what do I do for fun then? But but you once you stop do stop doing the elite level sport, did psychotherapy come next in, in your career? I wasn't sure if it was that or the or the adventure syndicate. So you yeah, guide me like- here. Psychotherapy was before, so... Right. Um, Tell us about, about that. Yeah, so that was a really interesting time. So before I started racing, um, I was living in the Highlands of Scotland and I was working as a school counsellor. Um, and I, it was my job to work with uh, usually the, the boys, like the 14, 15 year old boys who were um, excluding themselves from school because it just wasn't working for them. And it was my job to sort of try and meet with them and figure out what was going on for them and draw them back in, essentially. Um, and it just it just didn't really work because uh, I, that was that was education's agenda to bring them back into that building that wasn't working for them for a whole bunch of different reasons. And so while they were in that building and talking to me, then they were like, well, I don't want to be here, Lee. And I could totally understand why we were in a centrally heated one-to-one room and it just wasn't working for me and it wasn't working for them. These boys wanted to be out and moving and, you know, expressing and uh, and having some freedom and uh, it really felt like, well, here's an opportunity because... Um, because of my outdoor background, I was qualified to be able to take them out and do outdoor adventurous things. Um, I knew from past experience as an outdoor instructor that the quality of relationships you can establish in those settings is second to none and certainly nowhere near what you would establish in a one-to-one room in a guidance department of an <laughs> overheated secondary school. And so we, so yeah, I just, I, and I was starting to race at the time as well, so I needed a bit more autonomy in, in my work, like, um, how, how, how much I worked and when. So I just pitched it to, um, to area education office in Highland. How about I take these boys mountain biking instead one-to-one um, and that can count towards the education that they're missing. And it just, it just worked. It just worked for... In what, in what way? Because it sounds like a so- soft option there, you know. Uh, you don't have to go to school, you can go out mountain biking, eh? <laughs> yeah, I know that is what a lot of people automatically assume isn't it that these guys that are that are having such a, a horrible time and displaying it with antisocial behavior which is the bit that we all focus on isn't it hang on a minute these guys are are disrupting things and then they get rewards for it if we if we just wind back from a moment and we ask ourselves well why are they disrupting why are they why are they behaving in this way because that's the bit that you need to work with it's it's not it's not the the clamping down on the behaviour itself you're not going to get anywhere with that you need to work out what, what it is that they're asking for and more often than not they were always just asking to be heard, to be respected to be allowed to express themselves to be allowed to do things in a different way to be physical, to be outdoors like these boys, they come from generations of 
um, of uh, workers, you know, grafters, um, and they and they, and they want to be outdoors doing physical things. They had so much energy, and they were just not able to spend it. Um, and so, as soon as as soon as that part was listened to, then you could just there was this there was just this tangible relief, um, and we were able to we were able to build this mutually trusting, meaningful relationship in the outdoors. And I guess that is the learning. You know, it wasn't that we went mountain biking. It was that they realised that not all adults were out to get them. And that actually <laughs> there, was a, there was a possibility that um, they could they could be something, you know, they, they were here, they were, they were good at something. There wasn't always somebody telling them what to do. They could, they could limit, they could put their own limits on, on whether or not they thought something was safe or whether they could manage something or, um, and they were so good at riding bikes. Like some of these boys were incredible. And, you know, for somebody to, to sort of stand back on her heels and say, wow, you know, you're really good at that. Um, I think that's probably not some a message that those boys had heard very much. Um, and so for all of these reasons, the relationship worked. And then that relationship could be used to get into the bigger issues if they wanted to go there, if they wanted to talk about what was making them angry or sad or, um, you know, what, what they might want out of their life. Um I mean, that's, yeah. that, that, that sounds great. I, I did a piece a couple of years ago. Um, it was a school, uh, maybe I shouldn't say exactly where it is, but, but the, this vocational side of education is, is, is clearly more important, especially if you live in a rural community. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's just as important as, as having your hires and, your, and, and, and more um, mm. for, for a lot of people who are never going to go into any form of academic job. They're going to get jobs outside. They're going to be working physically, and that's what they want to to do they've got no room for being inside and I, I was mm. with a couple of young lads 15 16 year olds who were working as river rafting guides uh, that mm. was part of their placement and, oh, and, and they'd come out from this and they were doing they were taking groups of tourists down a river in a raft so they were responsible eventually eventually mm. they were once they got good enough to looking after them and so from that they learned communication skills they learned responsibility they le they learned to have faith in themselves mm. uh, and and I, it was just brilliant it was one of the mm. one of the best stories i think i've ever done but but we uh, sorry go ahead <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I bet, I bet they were good at it. Uh, yeah, oh, think, absolutely. But so often we don't give them that sort of, that clout, do we? We just assume that that these young people have got nothing to, to offer. I learned so much from, one of those boys taught me how to wheelie. You know, there's so much to learn <laughs> from, from our young people if we just open our minds. And, and you and I met because you were working with a group of four uh, teenage girls uh, from right. a school, and you were you were kind of chaperoning them on the Strath Puffer when when we were filming there. Um, but but that that was part of the adventure syndicate thing, wasn't it? When you started that, it was fairly new in, in that. Could you just talk a little bit about it and this idea of bringing on younger women in into the outdoors, which, which is obviously parallels, but it was mainly young men, I think, with the cycle, uh, the psychotherapy. Yeah, yeah, it's an it's an interesting sort of slide over. I guess that the adventure syndicate came post racing, so um, so throughout my time racing, I was sponsored by various bike companies, but I was always a little bit, um, I was always a little bit. <sighs> I think disgusted is a bit too strong a word, but I wasn't that impressed by the emphasis that seemed to be placed on a female athlete's physical form rather than her race results. <laughs> okay. And it seemed very much like it was all about how somebody looked rather than how they performed. I was like, this isn't right. And I looked at my male oh, counterparts God. and they were, you know, they were given sponsorship deals based on how they performed. And I was just, it just didn't sit right with me. And I started sort of looking around at the bike industry in general and the clothes that are designed for us by oh, the right. same middle-aged white male marketing directors. And I was like, hang on a minute. This is the shrink it and pink it phenomenon. As all of that, said, this is wrong. This is so wrong. I mean, and there's nothing wrong with small pink clothes for people that want them but the point is you know women are not just one one yeah. being you know yeah. we need a we need a variety of role models and we you know we need we need people that are different shapes and sizes and um and of different 
different backgrounds and have different value systems. We just diversity is absolutely key. Otherwise, all our young women are going to be looking at these screens and think, "Oh, I need to be that way in order to be a in order to be a woman. I need to be that." And we just wanted to ask, ask the question: Well, actually, what does even being a woman look like? And could you identify as a woman but also be, you know, some of these characteristics that are typically associated with being male like strong or covered in mud or you know and it's these sorts of questions that I think are really important that we keep asking um, and that young people hear that we're asking um, and and that way we can make sure that there's a diverse set of role models so that everybody can aspire to be what feels right in their core and it's they're not changing, forced though, into a it? box. Oh, massively. It's it's changed. It's changed so much in the time the Adventure Syndicate set up. I'm sort of thinking, you know, we're kind of even not needed anymore because young people have taken that mantle and and it's and it's accelerating at, at pace. And I think that's fantastic. It was actually quite funny because I edited the the Adventure Show thing that we filmed, and you were riding behind one. Well, you had to go around with these four teenagers who who were riding the course, uh, and you had my little GoPro on your wrist, and, and it was recording all the audio, and just saying to this woman, uh, this girl who's in front of you, who you're chaperoning, and there's a line of blokes in front of them, you're saying, just say just say to them, coming through, just tell them, <laughs> go through, just go through. You're better, you're faster than them. Go, go, and and she went, and by and she went, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> they, they did well. They were second. They were second in the quads, weren't they, or something? Oh, they were. They were brilliant. They did so well. That was a competitive year for the quads as well. And, the, and those girls, so they were all under sixteen, and they were excellent riders, like absolutely excellent riders. And I've done the puffer for for years, and sometimes in groups of people that have been much less tenacious than those four girls. And um, yeah, out on course with some of them, like in the early hours, you can see them just, you know, they're they're excellent, but it's such an intimidating environment, like 24 hours in the dead of winter in the snow, surrounded by burly blokes with beards. And you're coming up behind them and they're a bit like, oh, surely I'm not better than him. And they're just, just, you are, go past him. He'll just slow you down. And that sort of permission, I think, is is something that... that Every, everybody needs to to hear, you know. I think I think no, I, I was going to say young girls need to hear because they typically lack a little bit of confidence in that arena. But I think you know anybody lacking confidence should just take a moment to think. Actually, what is my value here? Because there's a lot of people that shout a lot about their importance, and they're rarely the ones that have the that have the the skills and the and the qualities that mean that they should be up there leading from the front my my big moment of joy from that and it wasn't the girls actually it was pointing my camera at you and jenny when jenny hadn't got a clue that you and her had actually won the pairs <laughs> totally by accident <laughs> i know that was, that was not so, supposed to happen that was so funny <laughs> oh god i had to cut off i was laughing so much the camera was actually <laughs> bouncing on my shoulder anyway. <laughs> Okay, um, the whole idea of this is talking about adventures, and I've just watched your uh, TEDx talk uh, with your sidekick, Jimmy the Shand, on oh, the yeah. Highland Trail 550, uh, where you, you four days, five hours and 50 minutes. My God, what a blooming record. For people who don't know, just explain what the Highland Trail 550 is. So the Highland Trail is a self-supported bikepacking race like an, ind an individual time trial so um you start in tindrum in in, in scotland sort of the low highlands and you do a great big figure of eight all the way around the scottish highlands and you finish up 550 miles later back in tindrum you can eat and sleep when you like but the clock doesn't stop and you have to be totally self-supported so you have to carry everything that, that you need um along the way you can resupply from shops but but um but that's all. So, so what sort of the stuff are you carrying? And so I'm carrying, I'm going as light as I possibly can. Um, so I'm carrying a sleeping bag and a raw mat and like an emergency bivy bag on, on the front of my bike. Um, on the back, I've got a really lightweight down jacket, waterproofs, um, bike repair stuff, um, tiny emergency first aid kit um, and some food. And, and that, and, that's and, it. and that, 
and that's it. And actually, a couple of times, I just I kept riding through the night. I didn't even get into my sleeping bag. And it just it's just, it's just incredible how little you actually <laughs> need. The caveat to say that the the times that I've done the, or the times that I've completed the Highland Trail have been excellent weather. So you you could I could have got away with none of that. Just carried some food and a and a spare layer, which is just astounding, isn't it? Five hundred fifty mm. miles through the Highlands. Is it um, all off road? Um, no, there are some sections of road, but the vast majority of it is off road, and. And a huge amount of it is <laughs> is unrideable. Oh, that, so, that was going to be my next question. How much is rideable? Yeah, so it's the first bit's really fast. So you get up to um, Glengolly in the very far north, right up in Ascent Sutherland. You get up there really quick. You're on like Fire Road or Canal Towpath or or um, or uh, tarmac with just a little bit of single track, and you're up there fast in like less than two days, and then. And then the, the way back down is slow. It's really slow. Um, well, hang on. If you went up in two days and you did it in four, how many, in four, day, four days, four days and five hours, you weren't that slow coming back. Well, well I, so that that was the first time I did it. I actually did it another four days a couple of years ago. Oh, God. Um, so so the, I guess to the, to the far north, the second time I did it, I did that in a day and a half. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, it, but... It, it sounds like this sort of feat of absolute athleticism. It's it's not. You just keep going. I'm not going fast. I'm not being a hero. I'm just. I just keep turning the pedals and I don't sleep very much. But are you going too fast to enjoy it? No. And this is the thing. So people ask that. Why would you do that? You're moving through this amazing place. Why would you choose to do it that fast? Why would you not want to stop and look around and? And I get that, and I do do that sometimes, but something that I just, I, I try really hard to communicate, and I wish there was a way I could just pocket the essence of this and sprinkle it to your listeners, but I don't know if I can, but let, let me try. There's something about the way, the state that you get into when you are travelling self-supported like that through sunsets and sunrises and all those elements are passing over you and you're watching the sky change and you're feeling the temperature fluctuations and you're smelling every, like senses your senses are so heightened because you're just so immersed in it um, and then the sleep deprivation kicks in and so you know you flip there's some other sort of survival thing that comes in and your brain is like on hypersensitivity mode it's your senses are just soaking it all up um, it's just it's the most primal feral all-encompassing wilderness immersion that you could possibly imagine and yeah you're moving fast and it's as a result of you keeping moving that you're doing this thing that, that this is the state that you're getting into but it's it's absolutely magical and I connect with the wild places that I'm passing through in a way that I need to sort of tussle with if I'm moving slower, like if I go into the hills with a rucksack on for five days, I'll get there eventually. But you're like, you're immediately there and on something like the Highland Trail. Um, and there's something about that physical exhaustion as well that, that goes with that. And uh, it's, ju it's, just, it's just incredible that you're drawing energy. You're not drawing energy from the sleep you're getting or the food you're eating, you're draw but you're drawing it from somewhere. I have never felt more energised and alive and connected than I have in those four days. Uh, and, uh, and you were clearly buzzing when you came back because I read your blog post about that. You go, I can't wait to write this up, but it must be difficult to capture in words that, that moment. So, yeah, after the, the first time I rode the Highland Trail, I sat for three days and just wrote... I was so wired, like I slept for 24 hours and then I started writing and I couldn't stop myself. So that actually, put, and I've only ever had that once in my life and that was then. So what I wrote after the Highland Trail, I, I still had sort of one toe in that experience. And so I think my words, I don't know, I go back and I read my words and I can get back where I was. Um, I don't know if other people can, but that felt like the closest that I'll ever get to putting real feeling into into words um, but I think yeah I think they're my words and so 
you can read if you want, but ultimately I think you've just got to go out there and have your own experience. Um, the, the, the the photographs you've, you've sent me, um, the one I think I'll use is that one I, I mentioned just before we started, which I all the red around. This is you doing the Silk Road race. I'm wondering, it, I'm assuming that, isn't it? You said it was in Kingsdown, yes. yeah. That's right, yeah. Um, I, I'm assuming... It, no, 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 I'm not, I'll not assume anything. What is, do, do you get that same sense of immersion of feeling on something like that race, which is such a completely different environment? Uh, and th this is, looks like red parched desert, but mm -hmm. you were saying that day started completely differently to that. And I'm wondering how you would do a compare and contrast of a bikepacking adventure like the Highland Trail with the the sort of race or even just riding it doesn't have to be a race in in mm. somewhere like somewhere like Kyrgyzstan on the Silk Road. Mm. There's, so there's definitely something um, very comforting and familiar and uh, confidence inspiring about being on home soil. Um, I, 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 under, I understand the highlands, I understand the weather systems, I know how the trails work, I can expect what the ground's going to feel like. There's some very evocative smells that I just associate with the hills in Scotland. and um, so, so, so there's something very special about the Highland Trail and about that terrain, for me definitely, having lived in, and grown up in, in Scotland. But I think it is just wild spaces. Even in Kyrgyzstan, I've been all, all, ridden my bike all over the place in, in the Alps and, in, you know, in the Rockies and in, in the Andes. And, and all of these places have something similar. And and that I find so uh, comforting because, when, when it, you know, if you're feeling low or depressed or disconnected or homesick or anxious, then... Wherever you are in the world, if you just find green space, or for me, if I if I get up high um, and I'm in a mountain environment, or if I get by the sea, you know these things where you're connecting to the basic elements that run through our whole planet. That's the stuff that that gives me comfort and solace and grounds me. And so when I was in Kyrgyzstan, I wasn't in a great place actually. In Kyrgyzstan. Um, well, not for was, sea, not for green spaces. Not looking at these photos. <laughs> there wasn't tons of sea. Um, there was <clears throat> loads of green space, though. Oh my goodness. Oh, oh there was. That, okay. Yeah, loads, loads. Yeah. So that photograph was taken at the end of the day after a five-hour descent from um, high alpine. Um, snow-covered tundra so just you know five hours before I was absolutely freezing my off at the, at the top of this hill and then I, and then I descended out of the clouds and for five hours and landed in the desert so so you know that there was that there was that really familiar green landscape and then dropping into the valleys dropping into the desert yeah I always take a little bit of adjustment to that it was the same when I rode the Tour Divide in, 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 from Canada to, to Mexico. You know, I was in the, the lush, green, um, high alpine places that I feel comfortable in. And then I dropped down into the desert of Mexico and I'd immediately be out of my comfort zone. Like, well, how do you respond in this? But it's that same thing again, you know, earth is earth and the sky is the sky and the sunset is the same. And you just, once you've readjusted to that, then, then you feel safe again. I hope you enjoyed that. In Other Ways to Win, Lee tells those stories in much greater depth. There are more stories than I've had time to cover, and there are deeper themes running through the book. We touched on some of those in part one. If you have enjoyed it, you could do two things in return, please. Leave a positive review wherever you get your podcasts, and consider buying me a coffee. There's a link in the show notes. It's a very small contribution towards the monthly hosting charges I pay to keep this series live and advert-free. I'm Simon Willis. Thanks for listening. Goodbye.